Greetings from Michigan State University and welcome to EAB University's 2018 Fall Webinar Series, which is funded by the USDA Forest Service. This is Robin Osborne and along with my EAB University colle colleague, Cliff Sadoff and Elizabeth Barnes from Purdue University and Amy Stone from The Ohio State University, we welcome you to today's webinar, Lingering Ash, Are There EAB Resistant Ash Trees? Our presenter today is Jenner, Dr. Jennifer Cook, research biologist with the USDA Forest Service in Northern Research Station in Delaware, Ohio. Her work focuses on the genetics of host resistance to invasive insects and diseases, developing methods to identify, propagate, and breed resistant ash trees, and also she has been working on beech bark disease resistant American beech trees. Most, um, she has been um, able, to, she also works on developing methods to identify, propagate, and breed resistant trees. If you have questions today for Jennifer during the presentation, please type them in the chat feature and she will respond to them after the webinar presentation. After today's webinar, you will be emailed a link to a short, voluntary, confidential survey that we hope you will take the time to fill out. For those of you wanting CEUs and CCH credits, I will be sending information on how to obtain these in the aforementioned email with the, that will have the um, survey. Thank you for attending everyone today. And Jennifer, let's go with your presentation here. And now you're unmuted. Okay, great. Thank you, Robin. Um, and thank you to EAB University for inviting me to give this presentation. I'm excited to share our work on um, using a genetics approach to restoring green ash by breeding for resistance to the emerald ash borer. Um, before I get into anything too far, I wanna always start out by pointing out that what the kind of work that we're doing is very labor intensive and it takes a whole network of people. So I wanna acknowledge my collaborators uh, within the Forest Service, Kathleen Knight, Therese Poland, and Dave Carey as well as external collaborators, Mary Mason at The Ohio State University and Jean Romero uh, Severson at the University of Notre Dame. So for those of you have, who have tuned into EAB University talks before, um, I'm sure you're well aware of all of the damage and the impacts that the incredible damage that the emerald ash borer can cause. And so most notably is that uh, within 99 to 100% mortality can occur within four to seven years of the first emerald ash borer symptoms being observed in a stand. And this has led to green, white, black, blue, and pumpkin ash listed as critically endangered species on the IUCN red list. You're probably also aware of the different management strategies that are available or have been tried to control emerald ash borer, such as eradication when the infestation was first identified. Of course, if it's at all possible to stop it in its tracks, we wanna try that. So there was a lot of resources and effort invested in cutting infested trees and trying to create ash-free zones so that EAB uh, would just sort of die out once it killed off the, re the ash trees that it was, it was contained to. Um, hmm. So, oh, okay, I was gonna say today my, my slides aren't working quite as well. Um, but unfortunately, we did not have efficient tools that allowed us to detect EAB infestations, and there were so many outlying infestations that this approach was abandoned. Um, there's now some research on called SLAM, or slow ash mortality, trying to figure out ways through combinations of tree removals, insecticides, and trap trees to slow down ash mortality, but this is not an approach that's actually going to eliminate mortality nor eradicate emerald ash borer. And you're probably also aware that there are four parasitoids from China that have been approved for release in the United States. And um, there we go. Uh, for some reason, there's a lag on my slides today. Um, so pardon that. But anyway, the high mortality rates that we see in North American ash species that are planted in China, despite having these na native parasitoids in China, 
while the resistant native Asian ash species have high survival rates, indicates that biocontrol alone may not be sufficient. And so our work is to try to, I'm trying to change slides. There we go. I think I've skipped one now. Um, our work is to try to couple um, resistance, host plant resistance, in conjunction with biocontrol to hopefully give ash the best chance of survival and regeneration. So host resistance, many of you, especially if you've been paying attention to emerald ash borer since the beginning, have probably heard lots of reports that give very little hope of resistance actually existing. There were headlines that said all native species of ash are susceptible, uh, headlines saying that, um, you know, this is the end of ash and that we are going to forever lose our ash trees. But I apologize, I'm not sure why <laughs> this, yesterday it worked just fine uh, when we did the little practice run, but I can't get the slides to switch at all now. I wonder if this will work a little bit better. Um, thank you for bearing with me. There we go. So many of you may be wondering, does resistance exist based on previous reports that were pretty much doom and gloom? Um, and I wanna take a minute to talk about what resistance really looks like, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there. And so for this slide, I've borrowed and um, sort of converted definitions from this nature review paper to uh, fit this particular example. And I'm like, would like you to think about resistance in terms of it being the ability of a tree to limit or partially limit insect growth. So resistance is really the ability of the tree to have an impact on the insect. And tolerance would be the ability of a tree to survive a given number of insect attacks relative to a susceptible tree. So this is how badly does the insect impact the tree. So resistance and tolerance may simply be present in a way that just allows trees to live longer relative to fully susceptible trees. And if we can identify trees that have some level of resistance or tolerance, we can potentially improve them even farther through the process of breeding. So what does, where do we expect to find this resistance or this tolerance or these trees that can just survive longer and why would we think that they even exist? Well, genetic variation, especially in trees such as ash that are, are outcrossing trees, has been the basis of applied tree improvement programs since the early 1950s. There is a tremendous amount of genetic variation in natural stands. And it is possible that among all these very diverse trees, each individual is its own unique genetic makeup, just like you and I that there could be combinations of rare genetic variants that could confer a level of defense against emerald ash borer. And even though these trees haven't co-evolved with emerald ash borer, they may have developed these defenses to a native pest or some other stress. And certain combinations of them also just happen to allow them to defend themselves better against emerald ash borer. And in our North American species, we would expect these individuals that have these favorable combinations of genetic variants to be rare before EAB came in because there was no selective advantage to having them. Now that EAB is here, there will be an advantage. So we would imagine in a population that these individuals will stand out at some level, but we still anticipate that they would be rare. And I think it's also important to point out that this is not a novel concept. There's other examples of native tree species that have resistance genetically heritable resistance that can be bred for to invasive insect species. And one example is beech bark disease. Um, 
there's an invasive beach scale insect that is involved in that disease. And we have a program that we're currently working with all sorts of partners developing seed orchards and we're able to breed for and improve resistance in beach populations. So thinking about this a little more, what do we anticipate or this genetically diverse population of ash, the range of phenotypes to emerald ash borer to exist, to, to look like. We expect that there will be all different types of resistance and susceptibility, that within the ash population, there will be an, a range, a continuum, ranging from susceptible to partial resistant to possibly even fully resistant. But the, the caveat being that we would anticipate that the susceptibles that are fully susceptible is going to be the most commonly occurring tree. Again, because these trees have not co-evolved with inse this insect, there's been no selective advantage to having any sort of resistance that would make it a more common feature within the, the population. Um, we would expect some sort of partial resistance or tolerance that's illustrated in this picture where unlike the fully susceptible tree that you can see has been completely eaten up by emerald ash borer larvae. This one has had some evidence of larvae feeding, but, but also evidence that it has recovered. And this tree remains growing and it remains healthy. Um, and then on the far end, we, the ones that may be more fully resistant or at least closely closer to being fully resistant, we would anticipate would be incredibly rare. Um, and in the photo here is a picture of a tree that we found um, in a stand that is located, in one of the few surviving trees in a stand, and it's literally right next to several trees that have been killed by emerald ash borer. And we could not find evidence of a single um, emerald ash borer attack on that tree. But again, something that would be very rare. So putting this con in the context of, of natural selection, when you have this genetically diverse population and you have this continuum of phenotypes and then you have an insect come in and attack, what do we anticipate that to look like? So what this slide is showing is, uh, you know, your array of individuals. So the susceptible ones, there are gonna be some that are highly susceptible, some that are a little bit less susceptible so they might take longer to die. And then your resistant and tolerant ones. Uh, that are going to survive longer than any of these susceptible ones, and some of them might be fully resistant. Um, so then when the emerald ash borer comes in, the most susceptible trees are going to be attacked first. Those are the ones that are going to be lost first. And in the next, so that immediately causes a selection event so that the trees that are remaining that have survived, they're going to be some of the susceptible ones that maybe just haven't quite died yet, but they're on their way out. And then we're gonna have this array of resistant trees, some with varying levels of resistance or tolerance. And what this means is that in this population has now been enriched for resistant parents. So there's more, uh, more likelihood that a resistant tree would breed with another resistant tree because there's, they make up a higher proportion of the population. And so when that happens, you expect a higher proportion of the resulting progeny to also be resistant. You're still going to get susceptible progeny. And in a natural stand, we expect that it's going to be continually under selection pressure from the EAB. So these susceptible ones are going to continue to be killed off. Um, but this is an example of how natural selection will be increasing population level resistance in each generation. In each generation over time, you would anticipate to get continually better. But what happens if the remaining trees are too few and far between, which is what we're seeing with emerald ash borer. So we have a bunch of highly susceptible trees and we have a few trees that are resistant or maybe even just slightly resistant. Um, and emerald ash borer comes in and it takes out just about everybody. So we might have a susceptible tree that just hasn't died yet but it's well on its way out. And we might have some healthy trees remaining, but there's so few of them that we don't have enough genetic diversity left. And they're so physically far away from each other that they can't actually cross pollinate. So in this example, we need to intervene and we need to use breeding programs to actually move these trees physically close enough together so that they can breed. Um, and this is done through development of seed orchards or through seed collections. Um, and we'll talk about the approach we're taking in the rest of the, the presentation. Um, but it's really important that we help the process 
of natural selection along by intervening to do a breeding program in this situation, or we could do nothing and risk extinction. Um, this lack of genetic diversity that would, would happen as illustrated here, could also make this population very vulnerable to other stresses, such as climate change, drought events, um, and either and even um, new and different invasives that might show up on the landscape. So we set about looking for lingering ash. We were fortunate to have some great partners to work with, uh, Dan Herms, Kathleen Knight, um, who set up monitoring plots, and I'll, I'll show a picture of that in a minute. Um, but one of the things that we were looking for were areas where EAB was around for a really long time. Um, so we wanted to make sure that there was enough time for a lot of mortality to occur. Um, we were looking for trees that are large enough to have been infested during peak EAB because we know that EAB has some size preferences. It, it likes, it doesn't like trees that are on the smaller end. Um, the peak area is about six to eight centimeters. So we targeted trees that are greater than 10 centimeters in the monitoring plots greater than 20 centimeters dbh um, if it's outside of monitoring plot and we didn't have that annual yearly data on it and of course we wanted to see a healthy canopy like with the one that's shown in this picture we were looking for trees that stayed alive at least two years after the mortality rate in the stand had leveled off and we'll take a look in a little bit about what that looks like or else um, also that seems to equate with about four years after the stands hit 50 percent mortality and so this is a, um, an example of one of the monitoring plots that Kathleen reported. This is actually her slide. And she actually has an EAB University talk that's available through their YouTube channel. If you check under um, 2016 and you want more information on Kathleen's work, I encourage you to go there. Um, but just to take a peek at one of her slides to give an example of, of what we're looking at. Um, as Emerald Ash Borer enters the stand over time, the green line is looking at the percent trees that are still alive. So we see that over time, the percent living trees is being reduced and the number of EAB that is being trapped is increasing. And then once the, the trees start to die, the EAB falls off pretty dramatically right afterwards. Um, but even though the EAB is slowly going down to zero, what Kathleen has observed is that the EAB is never actually going away. It's persisting in root sprouts and stump sprouts and, and uh, regeneration. Um, so at that lower EAB population, it's the, the remaining ash is enough to keep it going for a while. Uh, but the important thing is that you can see that the mortality rate of the ash trees has leveled off here, and that's when we wanna start looking for lingering ash. And again, that's about four, four years after 50% mortality has been hit in the stand, um, at least two years after uh, the 99 to 95% range. So this is showing the, the different plots that Kathleen and Dan Herms had set up um, early on in the EAB infestation. And the circles are showing the plots that we actually have selected lingering ash from. Um, the reason that our selections are focused in these areas is because at the time that we started this work, these were the plots that had had the levels of, of mortality that met our criteria uh, for selecting for lingering ash. So these are where the, the high levels of mortality were found at that time. Kathleen is continuing to uh, monitor her plots and will be continuing to look for lingering ash throughout the plots that she has in the state of Ohio. Um, in addition to finding a single tree in a plot here and there, Kathleen and Dan both found clusters of some lingering ash trees. And so that's depicted by the red stars. In one case, Kathleen uh, then did a, a broader survey along a seven mile stretch of Swan Creek, where she estimated there had once been 11,000 ash trees there and found about 100 that were still living in 2010 and four years later that was down to 51. Um, but these are all within some of the selections of lingering ash that we've accessioned into our breeding program. Um, so overall we're seeing about 0.1 to 1% across these plots, but that is not counting the many plots that had zero. So I would anticipate that overall we're looking at less than 0.1% of the green ash being considered lingering ash. 
Um, and I also want to point out that we're working in a very specific area and we have no reason to believe that this is going to be the same across the entire range of green ash. There may be variations in this in different populations of green ash as we continue to look. So once a lingering ash is identified, the next thing that we do is um, we need to bring it into our breeding program so we collect scion so that we can propagate an exact genetic clonal copy of the lingering ash tree. So it's shown in the picture, people are either using pole pruners. Um, if it's a bigger tree, we can use a slingshot to get a rope saw up there and we cut off a large branch. We do two types of grafting. One, we use larger gra grafts um, in a technique that is known as top grafting. And, and then sometimes we also use these buds to do bud grafting. This picture is illustrating the hot grafting technique that we used. Hot grafting is just a way to promote by heating the, the, uh, the graft union. This is a close up of the graft union that's also shown here. So heat cable is running through here, keeping that graft union warm while the rest of the tree is kept dormant and cold. Um, and by heating the graft union, we're just giving it a jump start and it's able to, uh, it's better able to form that union and give it a better shot of survival once the rest of the plant is released from, from dormancy. Um, and this is a critical technique with lingering ash because they're stressed trees and so they don't uh, graft quite as well as a, a healthy ash tree. But healthy ash trees are typically very easy to graft, especially through the bud crafting technique, which is illustrated here, where on your rootstock, the bud, the original bud was just cut out and then we place the bud from the lingering ash scion right into the notch that was left where the original bud was. The rootstock is then cut off and this forces growth to come out of this bud. Um, and eventually that growth will become the leader. And so both of these methods give us uh, clonally identical copies of the tree that's in the field. So it's something that we can now work with and we can establish in um, field tests or uh, do cross pollinations with. Um, and so the next step of this process has been to establish these field tests because we want to test now in different um, different regions in the field to to confirm if they're still going to display this ability to survive longer that we observed originally in the monitoring plot system. And so this is a picture of one that's set up with our partner at Holden Arboretum. In this, we have 10 grafted replicates of 40 lingering green ash and eight lingering white ash um, accessions, as well as known susceptible grafted green and white ash controls. So over time, we'll be able to watch what happens um, as emerald ash borer moves in and attacks these and see if we are um, confirming the same sort of behavior that was seen in the field when the selections were made. At the same time, we're a little bit impatient and we don't want to just sit back and have to wait for those trees to grow and EAB to come in and attack them. Um, so we've been working on developing bioassays to screen younger seedlings um, and so that we can start to identify resistance in smaller potted grafted ramets or seedlings quicker without, so we can then move only the best out to the field setting for assessment. Um, so it's a quicker way for us to look at resistance mechanisms and to screen for resistance. And so when we think about the EAB life cycle and when the, this insect is actually um, in contact with its host, possible points of resistance would be at oviposition, if the adult can actually um, pick certain trees to lay eggs on or not. Um, once these eggs hatch, then the larvae are, are growing. It's in contact with the host tree, so their host defenses could lead to larval mortality. They could delay development. They could produce larvae that have lower vigor, so they may not be able to overwinter and survive. Um, and they may not make it to emerging as an adult. So other points of potential defense responses from the, from the tree side. Um, and then it, when the adult emerges, the adult has to go through a period of maturation feeding um, of the, on the leaves. So if there's feeding preferences, that could be another uh, resistance mechanism, uh, especially since we also know that uh, mating occurs in the canopy. And after mating, if you haven't been feeding and mating it on those leaves, that tree may have a far less probability of having the eggs laid on it. And so far um, in our research, we have looked at larval development, 
and through doing egg bioassays and also adult feeding preference. And this work was done with our entomologist colleague, Therese Poland, and this is just illustrating the approach that she uses to do the adult feeding preference studies. She starts out by going into the field and identifying infested logs, cutting them down, bringing them into these um, collecting tubes where there's um, a, a little beaker at the end, and once the adults emerge, they're attracted to the light, so they'll collect in these beakers, and then Therese can pull out the EAB. The, the EAB are then put in cages with um, cut branches of different lingering ash selections as well as controls. Um, each leaf is scanned and measured before and after feeding, so Therese knows exactly how much of each leaf was was eaten by the emerald ash borer, and the leaves are changed on a regular basis. And so after going through this process, um, our first eight lingering ash selections, we found three of which were less preferred by adults for feeding. Um, so that does seem to indicate that feeding preference is a type of defense mechanism against EAB. In addition, um, we also do egg bioassays. So when Therese is co collecting the adult emerald ash borer, she can then put them into a female and male mating pairs in a container together. The container has a screen on top of it and then a coffee filter, and the female will actually oviposit through that screen directly onto a coffee filter. So Therese actually sends us coffee filters that are filled with emerald ash borer eggs, and that's what's shown in this picture. You can see a larvae that has, is newly hatched. Um, but we put these on the trees well before they've hatched, um, and we put multiple eggs on each tree. Uh, we literally tape the piece of filter that has the egg right onto the tree, and then we cover it with gauze to prevent any sort of insects that might be in our greenhouse from preying upon them. Um, we typically, this is showing a setup of one of our experiments in the greenhouse, and we typically use at least three grafted replicates of each genotype. So we have replication through grafting clonally identical versions of the same tree from the field or the same seedling progeny that we want to test. And we also have replication by looking at multiple eggs per tree. Eight weeks later, when uh, we would anticipate that a fully susceptible tree would, would have allowed a larvae to reach its fourth instar of the, the four instars that are involved in the EAB developmental process, we go back to our test trees. We check to see if the eggs have hatched. We can see the entry hole if the, the larvae did hatch, and we start from that hole and we very carefully trace the gallery until we find the larvae. And in this photo, you can see what looks to be an L4, a very healthy larvae. Um, but in this photo, you see a much shorter gallery, um, and it's leading to this much smaller uh, larvae that's actually been calloused over by the tree. So this is a host-killed larvae. It was killed by some sort of a defense response on the, in the, the tree. In cases where we can actually extract the live larvae, we uh, also weigh them. I wanted to point out in this slide that we've done all of these same bioassays using the Asian species that have high levels of resistance to emerald ash borer. And this panel is just comparing um, different phenotypes of this host killed response that we see. The top row is in Asian species, the bottom row is North American species. And just to il illustrate that that what we're seeing is the same in both. So we, sometimes we see a larvae that hatches and it, it just begins to burrow in the, the tree. It never makes it fully into the tree and all we see is this little dark spot remaining and no larvae. So this is a larvae that hasn't, re, hasn't survived. Um, in other cases, we see that this short gallery with the calloused over larvae at the end. And again, we see the same thing in Manchurian ash, one of the Asian resistant species. Um, and we also see larvae that um, go in, but not very far. They're in the very outer la layers of the bark, and they sort of meander around like they're looking for a place to, to dive in deeper. Um, but the tree is really actively responding by forming these raised lignified galleries, and eventually the larvae gets kind of encased in it, and it, it uh, never succeeds in fully um, developing. So this is an example of just the raw data of one of our first experiments using these bioassays to assess um, development of larvae in lingering ash trees compared to a susceptible tree. And each 
circle, each part, pie chart represents all of the larvae that were on all of the grafted replicates of each individual genotype. There's a susceptible control here, but all of the rest of these trees met our criteria as being lingering ash. So they were all had healthy canopies in areas where there was greater than 95% mortality. <clears throat> um, the color coding, brown indicates the proportion of larvae that were killed by host defenses. Green indicates the portion of larvae that were early in stars and blue represents the portion that are later in stars. Um, and again, the fully susceptible individual, all of those larvae have made it to the later in star, which is what we would expect. And if we look at our lingering ash test trees, we have some that have been able to kill a much higher proportion of larvae. Um, some have been able to kill a small portion of the larvae, um, but some is a pretty impressive portion of larvae. But I also want to point out that down here in the bottom right, that's a fully resistant Manchurian ash tree, and that was able to kill all of the larvae that were put on it. So our lingering ash tree are displaying the same responses as the resistant responses that we see in a Manchurian ash, but they're not doing it with the same level of um, efficiency. The other thing that we're seeing in two of these trees, you can see the little green slice of the pie, is that some larvae are not fully developed. So they've been delayed. So they should be at the L3 or L4 instar by this time period, but a, a small portion of them have only made it to L1 and L2. And so we don't know, since this is just a, a snapshot in time, that may indicate that these larvae are also going to go on to die and not fully develop, or they may, may be less vigorous. Um, we also have found differences in larval weights, and that's shown in this graph. The green bar down here, that's our susceptible control. So you can see that some of the larvae are just as fat and juicy as the ones that we see in the susceptible control. But in some of our lingering ash, the larvae that we were able to extract that are still alive have significantly lower larval weights. And so that may be an indication that they are, are potentially less vigorous and maybe less likely to survive to become adults, or if they do become adults, uh, perhaps they would be less um, efficient at laying eggs. So these could all be potentially me resistance mechanisms um, that the host is, is um, waging against the insect attack. So even though the lingering ash don't have the resistance level that is as high as what we see in the Asian ash tree. What we do know from, from genetics is that if you have different genes that are involved in dictating these different phenotypes, so for example, the growth inhibition, the smaller larvae has a certain combination of genes that cause that to happen in a tree, or the trees that have the really high larval kill, there's different combinations of genes that cause that. And if we breed these trees, we can combine those genes. Um, we can't, and so we would expect that when we breed them, we would produce progeny that get different combinations of genes from both parents. So some of the progeny are not gonna be very lucky. They're gonna get none of these good genes from the parents. So they're gonna be even worse off and more susceptible than either parent. Some of the progeny are gonna get some of the genes from one parent or the other, but not both. And so they're gonna be very similar to the parents. But some progeny are gonna be lucky enough to get the best genes from both parents, and they would be expected to perform and be even better able to defend themselves against EAB than either parent was. So at this point, we have actually been able to start doing crosses between some of our lingering ash parents. Um, and that's what this slide is illustrating. We have two parents here. Um, they were not, as you can see, they're not one of the best as far as the proportion of larvae they were able to kill. But they were selected because they happened to be the parents that flowered for us um, first. So we were they were the first parents we were able to do crosses with. Um, so again, the pie chart is the same. It's just showing uh, the proportion of larvae that were put on this tree that went to fully developed versus killed, host killed. Um, and what we saw in this small family was that exactly what we expected. There were some of the 
the progeny that were worse than the parents, so they were even more susceptible based on this bioassay. Some progeny were very similar in, to either parent because they were able to kill a small proportion of larvae, but then a good number of, of the progeny were actually better than either parent. They were able to kill a higher proportion of the larvae, um, they were able to delay de the development of some of the larvae, and if you look at this individual on the end, has made a dramatic increase um, in its ability to tree to to kill the larvae and defend itself against EAB in this bioassay. Um, so this this gives us hope that we're on the right track here, and that um, if we think about it, going back to our illustration of the the natural population, where we have this uh, continuum of susceptible to resistant phenotypes after our first generation of breeding, if we uh, look at it just in context of that one small family, so I, I do want to caution that this is, we're continuing to do genetic studies uh, with more and more families um, to get more data, but just based on the data that we have right now, um, that particular family is showing us that through breeding, we can actually um, lose most of the highly susceptible individuals, but we still have some that are susceptible there. And then we've also been able to shift it. So we're increasing in that family both the frequency of resistance within the family as well as the level of resistance. So the we now have uh, still have a rare individual that's pretty highly resistant in the progeny, but the ones that have partial resistance or tolerance are more common. Um, so the next step in this process, in the next generation, we would expect to continue this shift and to get even more, um, uh, to increase the level and frequency of resistance in the population even farther. So to accomplish this um, outside of our just single family example that I gave, as I mentioned, we're continuing to do many different crosses and we're actually taking a polycross breeding strategy so that uh, we do we're making as many crosses with as many combinations of the lingering parents that we have. Right now we have 50 lingering ash, uh, lingering green ash parents in our program. Um, and then we select the best of those progeny and we put them into a second generation seed orchard. And so then the best of all of the progeny from these lingering by lingering crosses are gonna be allowed to cross pollinate with each other. And the anticipation is that we will see even greater um, increases in resistance frequency and level in the seed produced from this seed orchard and at the same time because we're including so many different parents we're retaining genetic diversity we're working in uh, with all materials in that you know southeast south southern uh, Michigan northern Ohio so they're going to be adapted to grow in those areas um, so this is potentially the source that will be available for restoration in those areas and this this approach could be applied throughout the range of green ash and be um, a method to restore green ash throughout its range um, so again through breeding we can increase both the, the uh, level and proportion of resistance within a population and at the same time we have biocontrol that's helping keep the EEB population down so this gives us great hope that we can achieve sustainable green ash in North America. So hopefully some of you are thinking well what can I do to help um, and I do want to point out that we have an urgent need to identify and preserve these lingering ash. So even the lingering ash trees can mount a defense response against emerald ash borer that can extend life from four to eight years. Um, so far, we have some trees that we've been tracking for eight years now that have, have survived. Some trees have gone on to die because they're still being attacked by emerald ash borer. Um, and so they're still in a weakened state, which, which makes them more susceptible to being killed by other things. Like the, the one in the picture was killed by um, a wind event, um, but we also know through our bioassays and testing that they, even though they've died, even maybe eventually died from emerald ash borer attack, they are better able to defend themselves against EAB than the other trees that died before them. And that's kind of illustrated in this tree cookie from this tree that was killed, where um, several years back, um, about the onset of EAB infestation in this stand, there was a single attack, but this tree recovered and there was 
you know, very few seen from that point on. Um, but once these trees do die, the valuable genetic variants that they possess will be lost. So it's important to be able to identify the lingering ash and the data that we need to do this um, that people can get involved in is uh, first of all surveying in areas that have not yet been infested so that you know when you get emerald ash borer. Um, once you have emerald ash borer, it's important to do ash uh, mortality monitoring as well as EAB population monitoring. And then once you have areas that have long-term EAB infestation and that you've seen heavy ash mortality, that's the time you wanna start looking for lingering ash um, in monitoring plots or, or in more widespread surveys, once you know you've reached in that area, mortality rates of 50% and four years has gone by since, or you're two years out since about 95% mortality. And I do want to um, really emphasize that the knowledge of the extent of the infestation and the mortality levels, along with repeated observations. So not just going into the woods once and, and seeing a healthy tree, but repeated observations over multiple years is key. And um, just to illustrate that, I'm gonna use another one of Kathleen's slides from another one of her stands. And this slide is showing the green line is healthy ash, the black is dead ash, and the yellow is the proportion of ash over time of EAB infestation that's declining. So if you look at this period of time right in here, you can see that there's at least 50% of the ash have died and an, another good proportion of them is declining. So in various stages of decline, they're gonna look very sickly, but we still have a reasonable amount of healthy ash trees, which could look quite impressive when you see all these dead and dying ash trees around it. But if you just wait another two years from here, it's very likely that the, a good chunk of those healthy looking trees will have gone on to die. So that's why it's so important um, to monitor and to know that you're at this point where this mortality has leveled off and you're not um, mistakenly selecting trees here because we want to take advantage of unfortunately our best selection tool right now for identifying lingering ash trees is the emerald ash borer peak infestation as it's moving through. Um, so uh, we do have a couple of resources that I want to let you all know about um, and feel free to email me if you don't catch these. I think this tape will be available if you can't get all the information as I go through it. Um, but uh, through the tree search website of the Forest Service, there are several publications, but uh, the one in particular that describes all of the methods that Kathleen has used to monitor um, ash, as well as emerald ash borer populations in her monitoring, monitoring plots is in GTR 139. So if you use that uh, monitoring ash, and that, that is a key word, you should be able to find it through tree search. Um, we have a website, that's listed here where you can actually report a survivor ash tree. Right now it's limited to a handful of counties in uh, Michigan and Ohio, but we're working on getting that updated. Um, um, and um, it, in the meantime, if you want to know if your county, what level of mortality you have in your county, there has been this tool developed uh, by uh, Randy Morin of the Northern Research Station in, in conjunction with forest inventory and analysis data called the Emerald Ash Borer Impacts Dashboard. Um, and it, this is a screenshot from that. So this is the entire infestation area. And I, and I apologize, this is probably a little bit blurry, but it will tell you um, the ash volume that's remaining and also the mortality rate. So across the entire extent here, there's 2.2% mortality. But you can also zoom in and when you zoom in on an area, so in here the state of Michigan, it tells you across the entire area. So now you've got mortality rates that have gone up to 18.4%. There's another tool up here in the far left corner that you can use to select specific counties. And um, I didn't show this, but if you select a lot of these counties here, you're gonna get 100% mortality. Um, and this is just showing um, in a different area how that tool can select a specific county and, and, and again report that mortality rate. Um, so if you do want to help out with collecting data on lingering ash trees, uh, one avenue of reporting that, that, that data that is a very uh, user-friendly 
approach is the TreeSnap app. You can get more information on that at treesnap.org. Um, and there's multiple species that you can report on. But for the ash, it'll pop up and it'll ask specific questions. Um, and it, including about signs of emerald ash borer. And then you can click on different pictures that will illustrate things for you in case you are unsure about things. So you can use this to upload photos and to enter observations and give data about the extent of, of damage of the tree or the, the health of your tree. Um, so if possible, it would be good to report both healthy and diseased trees wherever you are reporting them. Um, and it's also good to submit observations annually on the trees that you're looking at. And if you go on the website, it gives you instruction on how to do that. There's another group. Um, it's a, a, a collaboration between Anic Data and the Ecological Research Institute. They have a project called Monitoring and Managing Ash Project. And if you go on their websites, you can find that they have uh, four different projects, EAB Ash Surveys, ash mortality and monitoring, lingering ash search, and potential lingering ash. And um, this is also app-based where you can report things. And um, of these four projects that they have, the two that have um, stars by them require that you attend uh, one of their training workshops, so you can get more information about that on their website. Uh, but then it is a place that you can deposit data and they can help you sort of analyze your data. Um, and both of these apps are available through both Google Play Store and iTunes. And both of these um, are going to make this data available to scientists um, so these trees can potentially be useful to advancing breeding programs. So uh, we encourage any of you that are interested to check those out or contact Kathleen or myself uh, if you have any questions. We're happy to help you if you're interested in getting something like that going. Um, and I want to end by acknowledging the many other partners that we have that have helped us with a lot of this work. And uh, very importantly, uh, the funding we have received, we were fortunate enough to get a special technology development project funded through the U.S. Forest Service State and Private Forestry Forest Health Protection Program um, and the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources has also funded our work breeding for lingering ash. Um, and on that note, I wanted to make sure that I left enough time that if anyone had any questions, we could do that now. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk, Jennifer. We're going to open it up to questions now. If you have a question, uh, please put it in the chat box and I will read it out. So our okay. first question says, great presentation, excellent progress. Do you have any plans to screen resistant trees against native borers? Um, that actually, so we're not going to, that, that will happen naturally <laughs> in our field trials. Um, we don't have plans to do that through any bioassays, but as trees are being grown out in the field, we do collect data on all sorts of injury, not just emerald ash borer. Um, and we have seen that, um, so again, if a tree is not adapted to a site or isn't happy or is stressed, you're more likely to see some native damage. And we've really seen that when we've done species trials. So on some of the European ash, for example, um, it really gets hammered by our native borers. Um, so yeah, that will be part of the total assessment, um, but it, so far it hasn't been nearly the problem that emerald ash borer is, so it's not the focus, but we're certainly going to pay attention to it as we're um, collecting data when we're growing our uh, parent trees and families out in field trials. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next question is, you mentioned that many Manchurian ash are EAB resistant, but we have uh, cottony facility here that have decimated Manchurian elm populations. Are you aware of any groups that are doing similar work against uh, cottony facility? And I think no. I can that right. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not aware of that work at all. Okay, so our next question is, is similar work happening for black ash? Yes, um, uh, we actually have three black ash, lingering ash selections. Um, and the reason that we don't have more is because the areas that have been heavily infested with EAB for long enough to have 
caused mortality at the level that we need to to be able to identify lingering ash trees has simply not had a high proportion of black ash growing there. Uh, we are now starting to see that in northern Michigan. Um, we're starting to see EAB populations move into some of the dominant um, ash, black ash, northern forests in Wisconsin and Minnesota. So uh, we anticipate we will see lingering ash uh, based on the information that we have right now, but until it goes through areas where there's um, much greater density of black ash and we get more and more information on a larger number of black ash trees, we don't know uh, if anything about what the, um, the proportion of lingering ash will be within black ash populations. Uh, we just know that we have been able to identify some that that do there is a variation within black ash seedling families and we've also been able to identify um, some some good performing lingering black ash we just haven't gotten as far because of the situation and it there's just not enough black ash that have been under enough eab pressure to select enough to get as far as we have with the other species okay so the next question we have is how big do green ash planted in Asia get before they are killed? Do some of them set seed over there? Um, yes, they do. <laughs> we actually, yeah, there are there are larger ash trees, North American species that that grow in Asia, um, and we were just having a conversation about this. So. Um, when EAB population, we, we know that even the most susceptible green ash tree can survive low levels of emerald ash borer attack, but that is rapid, that defense is rapidly broken down when you have an increase in the number of EAB attacks. So in general, in Asia, you would expect that there is a very low steady state of emerald ash borer because the Asian species is resistant and also because you do have parasitoids. So um, it may be that some of these larger ash are surviving because it's just they're not getting exposed to a high enough infest level of EAB to actually take them down. Um, but there are um, studies that have shown significant mortality in native species growing in, in China um, despite having high levels of parasitism. Great. So, oh, um, I shouldn't say China. I should say Asia. I'm not. I, I, I don't know that it was necessarily China. All right. Um, our next question is: Is there anything to do to protect uh, uh, new growth in ash? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Sure thing. Um, is there anything you can do to protect uh, new growth in ash trees? As in seedling regeneration. Um, I'm not. I'm sure. assuming. Um, so, um, the, the parasitoids that are being released, um, the one in particular is, the studies are being shown that it is able to parasitize the younger trees, so there is the potential that that might help, um, and the same chemical treatments that would work if they were appropriate for a seedling situation, but um, I would anticipate that seedlings will grow for a while until they reach the size classes that require, that are sort of required before the EB population starts to build up again. So it'll be interesting to watch um, the interaction between what is happening over the long run with the regeneration and the emerald ash borer. All right, our next question is, uh, does your program also involve blue ash? Are there more numbers of these trees than other American ash species? Um, so again, we don't have a lot of blue ash. Um, I, we, I believe we have one blue ash that was selected. We haven't looked at a lot for the same reason that we just didn't have a high proportion of blue ash in areas where um, 
the infestation was leading to high enough mortality rates for us to make selections. And blue ash is just not as, as prevalent a species because it has more of a specific ecological niche that it occupies. Um, but it'll be very interesting with blue ash because there have been studies that have shown that blue ash seemed to survive longer. Um, and people were interpreting that to think that they have greater resistance. Um, and a recent study that was published uh, by, I think, a group out of ARS actually went into a stand where blue ash and white ash were co-located and they put eggs on both and then um, cut down the trees to look at the development of the larvae between the blue ash and the white ash. So similar to the bioassays that I was talking about, but actually doing it in trees that were growing in the field. Um, and what they found was there were no significant differences in development of the, the larvae. So they weren't seeing that blue ash were killing larvae or preventing development. So the conclusion was that blue ash may lack the cues or be less preferred for either for overposition or um, feeding that may be leading to uh, adult preferences in overposition. But it appears that if a blue ash is located close to a susceptible tree, like when it's with near white ash, there's more of a chance of EAB actually just randomly laying an egg on it um, when you have really high EAB infestations. And once the egg is on it, it appears to be able to fully develop. Um, so again, the same thing with, with emerald ash borer. We don't know uh, much about the uh, frequency of those different types of phenotypes within the blue ash populations. But we do know that there's definite indications that they're behaving differently than um, the other ash species. All right, uh, our next question says, this is kind of troubling. Uh, we have to wait and uh, do we have to wait until many or most of the black ash die before we can identify lingering black ash? Is there any way to proactively select survivors? Yeah, that is definitely the um, the sad point, and it's not very satisfying to tell people when they're all anxious and excited about the fact that we can breed, you know, potentially breed for resistance when I say, okay, just sit back and wait and let all your, your trees die. Um, but right now, that is unfortunately our most cost-effective method of selecting for resistance. Um, however, we are doing research, and we recently got um, funding through APHIS to to work at developing screens that would be non-destructive but help us select these trees before they have all died. Um, so that work is just going to be starting this year. Um, and that, that is a goal of ours. And we're hoping that, obviously, we're going to have to work with green and white ash first, but we're hoping it will be translated into black ash at some point, too. So yeah, that, that is a goal. Um, it's something that's that's in the works. and at least we have a little bit more time when it comes to black ash because it's just now getting there. All right, are you simultaneously quantifying the genetic diversity of EAB that you are allowing to feed on the ash trees in your study? So no, we have not done diversity analysis on EAB that's in all of these different plots or the ones that we're using every year there's multiple trees that are selected and brought in um, but there have been studies previously that show there was a limited number of introductions of EAB in the first place so there is limited genetic variation within EAB um, in in North America as a result of that anyway so um, we do, when we do our bioassays, make sure that we're using eggs from multiple different mating pairs so that we're not just using the same line, for example. So we randomize that and each tree is getting eggs from different pairs so that we're trying to uh, attack, you know, use a genetic diverse source of eggs. And we're also selecting multiple trees so we're trying to use a genetically diverse source of the emerald ash borer. Okay, you mentioned EAB populations resurging as the trees get to a certain size. What size of ash in an area tends to cause a rise in EAB populations? So from what I, this is not my work and I wish I, I, I believe it was uh, Cassian was the first author, if people wanna look for that paper. But from what I recall, about eight to 10 centimeters is when you start to see mortality again. Um, and I don't remember if they were actually measuring the emerald ash borer populations. 
Um, but there were other studies done at the beginning of an EAB infestation as well as at peak EAB infestations where they looked at the preferences of emerald ash borer at first attack and that fa fell about in that six to eight centimeter range. Um, and larger trees were not preferred until after they had attacked in the upper canopy at about that six to eight centimeter range. Um, and there was a second study that uh, Kathleen Knight was involved in uh, looking at uh, sort of peak AB infestation and just peeling trees and measuring galleries. And she found about the same uh, preferred diameter, about six to eight centimeters. Our next question is, um, have hybrids such as uh, Mancana ash shown resistance to EAB similar to Manchurian ash? Um, so that's a very interesting question. I have a, a slide that I can actually pull up for that if, if people would like to see it. So Mancana is actually a cultivar. It's uh, not the hybrid. The hybrid is Northern Treasure and there's also one called Northern Dre Gem. So that's a, a hybrid between Manchurian ash and black ash. Um, and so there's been uh, two Gaumann Garden studies, and this data is published. The first was Rebic et al. in 2008, and Herms published it in uh, 2015. And in 2008, in that area in Novi, Michigan, that was considered peak EAB. So those trees were, you know, getting hammered by very high levels of emerald ash borer. And in that study, Mancana had this is a percent survival here. So Mancana, you know, over 80% of those survived, but the F1 hybrid, Northern Treasure, only a small percent survived. Um, and, you know, it was no better than black ash. Um, white ash has about 20% survival. Green ash is a little bit better than black ash. And that was over just a three year period. Um, there was a second study put in in 2006 at the same site. So this would be after the EAB population had crashed because peak mortality of ash in the area had been reached. So there was just less source of EAB coming from the outside to attack this planting. And so it took more like eight years before they started to even see measurable um, mortality. Um, and that's what's shown in these brown bars. So Mancana still equally well performing, but the F1 hybrid is almost as good as the resistant Manchurian ash. And we see a bump up at this lower EAB um, level in all, across all of them. So even fully susceptible green ash um, is surviving for eight years at low EAB infestation, about 15% of them. Um, so we know that uh, lower densities of attack will allow a lower resistance than fully resistant Manchurian ash to survive for longer. Um, so, and this one is, is incredible because if you actually compare the amount of resistance in this northern ash that has survived so, or northern treasure that survived so well under the low EAB densities, we actually did this experiment where we compared them using our bioassays under low and high doses. Um, so here's high dose northern treasure. So reflects what was observed in the field, that it couldn't kill as many of the, the larvae, but at lower egg doses, it could kill a lot more. Um, and then here was our best EAB lingering by lingering. So that is about the same level or efficiency of killing larvae. So we would expect that a tree like this, if you know that based on just this particular measurement, would survive as well at low EAB uh, levels that as Northern Treasure did. Of course, that remains to be seen because the big caveat was we're just measuring the EAP uh, development part of the story. So there could be other parts of the stories and, and it would have to be, you know, we still haven't field tested that at all. Um, but it is sort of a hopeful, gives us a hopeful view on the approach that we're taking. So we have um, a little bit of information here. Uh, it says the Indiana DNR nature preserves are protecting uh, big ash trees uh, green, white, black, in advance of EAB killing wave, purpose to have a seed source for future tree improvement work after the killing wave has passed by. This work is done in nature preserves and state parks. Uh, and then we have one last question. Uh, since 
there seems to be a extreme bottleneck. Do you think that, do you expect any inbreeding issues with the ash trees like you would see in uh, uh, animal populations? Um, there's, there's a risk of that, and that's something that we definitely have to be aware of, uh, but there has been a range-wide uh, population study of green ash, and show, it's been shown that it's very, very diverse, and there's only about three different sort of genetic subpopulations across the, the range. Um, and so that, so I think um, as long as we're aware of that, as long as we're assessing diversity in our seed orchards as we move forward, um, we can get enough parent trees. You know, right now we have 50 from a very, you know, from just south eastern Michigan and northwestern Ohio. Um, so 50 parents is going to give you quite a bit of genetic diversity. Um, and most likely those 50 parents are not very closely related to each other. They should be highly diverse. We haven't checked that yet. But the reason I'm saying they should be highly diverse is because the vast majority of them were selected from different different um, plots and stands. So, but it is something that we, you know, any breeding program should, con should be aware of and checking for the genetic diversity that they're capturing in their seed orchards. Because when you start making selections, there's definitely the risk that you are losing some of that genetic diversity. Okay, so that looks like that's all of our questions for today. Uh, thank you for coming to our last webinar of the semester. We hope you join us again in the spring and we wanted to thank Jennifer for giving a great talk and answering all of the questions. Uh, so that's, thanks. that's Thanks it. for having me. Thanks everyone for, att for attending.